Great. Uh, thank you all so much for joining us for the history of America's kitchens. From the colonial period to the present, the kitchen has been a source of nourishment and comfort. The way Americans have lived with their kitchens has changed dramatically over the course of three centuries. Historic New England curator Nancy Carlisle is back to discuss how the American kitchen has evolved from the 17th century to present day. Drawing on her book, American Kitchens, which was co-authored uh, with Melinda uh, uh, Nar uh, Narnav... <laughs> <laughs> Nasardanov. Yeah, okay, you say, <laughs> if you say so. Uh, Nancy will discuss the technological and social changes that have taken place in this room and suggest how these innovations have transformed kitchen work and changed women's lives. Again, I want to thank the friends of the Tewksbury Library, along with the libraries in Groveland, West Newberry, Ashland, Groden, and Andover for partnering with today's event. So let's give Nancy a big virtual round of applause. And Nancy, you can take it away. Thanks so much. Well, thank you, Robert. I really appreciate it. I appreciate everyone who has decided to devote part of your afternoon to um, hearing about the history of the kitchen in America. Um, I will tell you that um, it's a much bigger story that can, that can be covered in uh, 60 minutes. It's also actually a much bigger story that could be covered in a book, which doesn't stop me from promoting the book that was published I think in 2008, still available, although um, I will say we're having uh, a few difficulties getting it onto um, Amazon where it was, but uh, we'll continue to work on that. But in any case, um, there is a book that uh, says a little bit more about the topic than I can at this point. Uh, but I want to start by asking you to think about kitchens in your lives. Um, I have spent a lot of time, as you can imagine, talking to people about kitchens. And um, what I have discovered, of course, is that um, people think about time spent with their family in the kitchen. And um, I should say that this is a colleague of mine uh, at her home in Vermont with her daughter and granddaughter. Um, it's a photo that we wanted to actually use on the back cover of the book, but it was rejected for suggesting unsanitary conditions of the kitchen. Um, of course, if you have families, I think you will recognize that that might have been a mistake. Um, but in any case, families gather in the kitchen. Um, in addition, uh, people gather with friends in the kitchen. This is a group actually from Georgetown uh, near Groveland, where many of you are. Um, who used to meet uh, regularly to play a game together every month. Um, and uh, it was, of course, more an opportunity to chat and drink wine than to play the game. But um, nonetheless, the kitchen was at the center. But I'm guessing that many of you associate the kitchen with elders in your family. Um, and certainly it's a place where we can remember our grandparents um, or our grandmother spending time in the kitchen. And I know that there are still people around in Essex County who remember cook stoves like this one in use when they were children. If you spend any time talking to people about their kitchens, you will quickly find out that it's a room that's deeply linked to nostalgia. Um, I've, I've almost seen people's eyes missed over, um, sort of losing focus. Uh, but in fact, what they're remembering are wonderful meals lovingly served uh, to friends and family. But in fact, the kitchen is a more complicated space than that. Um, it can be a place of performance anxiety. Um, here's a woman trying to work through a uh, recipe from Cook's Illustrated which if any of you have tried can be um, frightening. Um, it's also, if nothing else, it is always a workspace. Um, and so it's curious that it uh, generates such warm feelings when in fact it's a workspace. And what people tend not to remember, but was, which is also true is that as the place where families gather, it can be a place of conflict as well. Uh, but you will not hear those stories when you talk to people about their kitchens. And I have to say that I have never successfully determined why there are such positive emotions around kitchens. 
um, I have a friend who's more scientifically minded than I, and he links um, smells to the amygdala in the brain, which is also the heart of emotion. And so he believes that that's why people think warmly about kitchens, but um, I have no proof of that. The reason that I started studying the kitchen is that as those of you who know historic New England will know, we have 38 historic properties, which range from, for instance, 17th century stone enders in Rhode Island to riverfront properties like this place, which if you haven't been, you'll really want to go in the spring. This is the Hamilton House in South Berwick, Maine, beautifully sited, beautiful gardens. Uh, and all the way up to the 20th century uh, Bauhaus of Walter Gropius. Um, and so within those 38 historic properties, believe it or not, we have more than 80 kitchens. And that's in part because there are outbuildings on the property that have kitchens, but there are also houses that have been built um, a la uh, front house, middle house, back house, barn, where kitchens have continued to be built in uh, a single house. We have, for instance, at the Runlet May House in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, an intact 1804 kitchen that was a technological uh, innovation in the um, early 19th century. It has its complete Rumford kitchen at the Spencer Pierce Little Farm in Newbury, Massachusetts, we have uh, a 1930s kitchen. Um, in fact, for me, the reason to study the kitchen is that for much of American history, it was a virtual certainty that the women of the family or for the privileged class, female servants were responsible for feeding members of the household. Therefore, the history of the kitchen is in many ways the history of women. It's a history that survives not in words, but in spaces, in artifacts, in routines, and in recipes. And for many, knowing what went on in the kitchen is the closest we'll ever come to knowing our grandmothers' grandmothers. So a little backstory about how we went about the study of the kitchen. And as you can imagine, we looked at books and we looked at documents as any good historian will. But we also very much wanted to tell the story with imagery. And so we looked in lots of places for images related to the history of the kitchen. Um, we went to the Library of Congress, for instance, where among other things, you can see here an early frozen foods aisle. Um, those were not uh, in existence until really after the World War, after World War II. Um, also this great image of a young woman cooking tortillas in New Mexico. And this was 2004, 2006. Um, at a time when more and more imagery was becoming available online. Uh, this is the um, Wisconsin Historical Society around 2006, I would say. As you can see, they had at that point 170 records related to kitchens. Uh, I haven't looked more recently, but I can guarantee that there are many more, and in fact, many more places. Um, so it might be a whole different ballgame where we to start all over now. But we also wanted to learn about <clears throat> what it means to cook using different technology. <clears throat> so one of the things that my colleague Melinda and I did was we went to um, living history museums. And here is the woman who cooks in a hearth at Williamsburg. Um, and we talked to her about how her kitchen was set up. Um, this is a woman who had been cooking in the same kitchen for 20 years at Sturbridge Village. And I had a chance to meet with her and get her to explain, you know, why did she have her pot here? What did she keep in storage? What things did she keep close to her? But even more importantly, we were lucky enough to find a woman in Long Island who has what she calls a kitchen experiment station in a carriage house in her backyard. And in that carriage house, she has recreated a hearth which was identical to one, an 18th century hearth in a historic house down the street from her. 
as well as adding a uh, 19th century cook stove, which you'll see in a second. So we spent three days with her. The first day we spent cooking on the hearth. And as you can see here, we've got a, a soup um, cooking in front of the fire. And what I learned, among other things, is that it's not about the flame, it's about the embers. And it's through the embers that you can control the degree of heat. So for instance, we've pulled a few embers out from the fire and placed them under this um, pot, and um, we can control the heat there. Uh, but this here is a Dutch oven, so it has a lid that will hold embers. So through that, you could bake. So you wouldn't have to start your bake stove every single time you wanted to bake bread or cake. Um, so in fact, you have embers underneath and embers above, so the heat is coming from a sort of surrounding source. So day one, we learned how to cook on the hearth. Day two, we started cooking on the um, cook stove. And the immediate advantage, which you can see, is that now we're standing up. And standing up was um, uh, something that we were both grateful for after a day on our knees or uh, squatting. Um, but of course, if you're used to squatting, it's um, not so hard and, and standing was not something that you'd consider when you think about cooking. Um, the other thing about cooking in a cook stove was that you lose sight of the heat source. So unless you are skilled, which of course we were not, um, before you know it, the flame can go out or your uh, logs can burn down to um, small ash. Um, so you have to be monitoring it, uh, monitoring something that you can't see, which is a little more complicated. And day three we spent baking uh, in a bake stove, which was eye-opening to me. So the way that you bake in a bake stove is that you fill the bake stove, the stove itself, with logs and you start a fire. And you let it burn for two to four hours. And you wait until you can peek up above the burning logs and see that the interior of the bricks have turned white hot. And once that's happened, you know that your uh, oven has heated enough, up enough that you're going to be able to bake um, for what you need. And the way that happens is that you remove the logs, you remove the embers with a damp cloth on the end of a long pole. And you start with your food that needs the highest heat. So you might put, for instance, your bread in first. Um, and you let that cook. As soon as you've got the bread in, you slam a um, metal or a wooden door in front of the opening to keep the heat in. And then you wait for your bread to cook. Then as your uh, stove starts to slowly cool down, you'll move on to cakes or muffins or slowly uh, later you'll move on to pies. And at the end, you'll put uh, beans, uh, like a big pot of beans in and shut the door and those can cook overnight. So it's this very intentional process, generally done once a week, um, because in fact, it's what you would be doing all day. I wouldn't give you time to do any of the rest of your many, many chores. So in addition to um, learning how to cook, talking to people who cook with historic techniques, we also wanted to discover as many surviving historic kitchens as we could. And so we wrote to every single state historic preservation officer in the country. We heard back from most of them and probably should not have been surprised by the fact that by far and away the most historic kitchens that survive are those in the Northeast. Um, in the uh, South, um, a lot of architecture didn't survive because of the um, termites amongst other things, but also because of the major transformation of society that took place in the South. Um, so we found a few other historic kitchens. Um, in New Mexico, um, we weren't able to find original um, kitchens from the 17th or 18th century. What in fact we did discover is uh, a sort of colonial revival um, kitchen a la New Mexico um, in, outside of Albuquerque. One of my favorite kitchens that's still intact is one in Kittery, Maine that belonged to a couple 
who had been servants in Philadelphia, who traveled north every year to um, work at their um, employer's summer spots uh, along the main shore. Um, and what they discovered every year as they traveled back and forth was that there were very few places, this is the 1940s, that were open to Black servants where they could rest, where they could feed. And so it would be a long, long trip without uh, good places to stop. And so together they decided that they would create their own stopover. And they did it in this small home in Kittery. They provided uh, room and board and they are still remembered by families, uh, Black families around Portsmouth for their um, generosity and also their wonderful meals created in this tiny kitchen. Um, and we'll get back to the size of kitchens uh, much later. So in the book, we decided that we would feature one particular kitchen per chapter and that we would use those chapters to then talk about kitchens in that period, in that region. So we start in the upper left with a kitchen that I'm going to talk more about in Newbury, Mass. We moved on to plantation kitchens, kitchens in New Mexico. And I won't talk about all of them because there isn't time, but I'll give you a sense of how things change over time. So Newbury, Mass, as I said, this is the Coffin House. Uh, it is a 17th century house, which has this um, 18th century, 18th, 1713 edition, which uh, is still intact, um, as is the 17th century portion behind it. Um, but you can see it on High Road if you ever drive along New, Newburyport and Newbury. Um, it retains the kitchen that was updated for the house in 1713 and then again around 1770. The 1713 edition added this whole room on the back of the 17th century house, which is behind this art. Um, and then the 1770s uh, was the addition of the paneling and the built-in dresser. We talk about it in the book in terms of how people were living there in the 1770s, uh, right around the time of revolution. And at that point, there were three generations living in the family. There was the um, owner and his wife, his son and daughter-in-law, and uh, their, their children. And what you see here implies that the, um, the mother and her daughter-in-law were working comfortably together in this single kitchen. But in fact, it's unlikely um, it seems, in fact, from um, what we know, that women tended to want sovereignty over their own kitchens, as many do today. And therefore, even if you had two women living together in the same household, if you had two kitchens, they cooked in two kitchens. Um, the reason I say that is that there's a wonderful um, memoir written in the middle of the 19th century by a woman who was then in her 80s, but remembers growing up in Newbury in the end of the 18th century. And she describes two sister-in-laws who end up moving in together for six months before one of them, their new houses is available. So for six months, they live together. And, and as the memoirist describes it, each of them uh, cooked on opposite ends of the hearth. So they each created their own individual meals without overlapping each other and without sharing the work. And as she writes, never a harsh word was spoken. Um, so I think that um, it's a mistake to think that uh, for convenience, women would have worked together when in fact, what was more important, I think, was for them to uh, have authority over what happened in their kitchens. Now, I don't know if any of you remember Abbott Lowell Cummings, but he was um, uh, remarkably, um, uh, he was a wonderful speaker. And he would describe what you see, I'm going to back up a second, in most um, historic house museums, he would describe what you would see in the kitchen as an obstacle course for curators, because in many historic house museums, 
every single kitchen implement that was ever in use in the town ends up in the historic kitchen. Um, but in fact, people lived with not much stuff in their kitchen. And this is a 17th century broadside telling people who are considering emigrating to America from uh, London what to bring with them. And you can see for yourself, it's a very limited list. In fact, once they arrive, all of their um, efforts go towards building uh, a livelihood, building a farm that works and produces. Um, and so it's a very long time before there's money for uh, so-called extras, like extra equipment for the kitchen. And that's true really for most of the economic scale of uh, settlers in New England. Uh, one of the things that we did was visit the uh, Plymouth Plantation where they are cooking using um, exactly what they know uh, the families lived with in each of the houses. Um, and we were able to talk to the woman who was the head of foodways for the Plymouth, um, Plymouth uh, interpretation. And what she said is that the um, enactors or the guides would um, couldn't wait till they got into a house where there was a frying pan because many of the houses didn't even have a frying pan. <clears throat> now there's a widespread belief that kitchen work was dangerous and indeed it probably was, but it was very rare for people to um, die from fire at least in the 18th century. Um, and here you see a young child who's uh, scalded. That's a different story. Um, young children being a little bit less uh, careful. Um, and you also see a South Carolina notice of a woman who has died from leaning over a fire. But that notice was published in New Hampshire. Um, and what that suggests is that this is such a rarity that when it happens, even all those many um, provinces away, it's, it becomes news, newsworthy. The misunderstanding is based on the fact that it wasn't until the 19th century when cotton becomes widely used that burning in a fire becomes um, more dangerous. Um, linen and wool, which is what women wore in the 18th, 17th and 18th century, smolders rather than flames. And so um, it was uh, something that could easily be put out. The 19th century is a different story, but at that point, the fire is less open. Most important thing I want you to understand about kitchens in the 18th century is that they were shared workspaces. They were the area which was kept heated. Often it was the one place that was warm. Um, at night um, in the uh, 17th century, the householder would read the Bible to his family and to any servants who were there. Um, and uh, certainly for butchering season, which was a matter of life and death for families, everyone would gather together and work together. And you would work at each other's properties to help process the meat in a way that um, kept it from spoiling. So it was processed quickly. So shared workspace, and then occasionally shared work as well in the kitchen in the 18th century. And now we're going to leap forward to the um, middle of the 19th century, and we're going to move a little bit out west to Springfield, Illinois. Um, and this is the home of Judge David Davis and his wife, Sarah. David Davis was a friend of Abraham Lincoln. Um, he traveled with him on the law circuit before Lincoln was elected to the presidency. And once he was, David Davis was brought in to serve on the Supreme Court. And the, as he did so, he left behind his wife, Sarah, and the, the house that they were building together. So in fact, she took on the um, details, uh, overseeing the details of the building of the house that you see here. And here's the kitchen, and here is she, Sarah Davis. Um, and it is uh, absolutely state of the art. And in fact, she writes to her husband in Washington and talks about um, what kind of stove she wants to install. And she has a near neighbor who has recently installed 
this big state-of-the-art stove, but she and that neighbor don't talk. So she tries to figure out a way that she can get into the kitchen to see the new stove um, and uh, decide whether she wants it or not. And in fact, she does figure out how to get there and she does uh, purchase the same stove for their kitchen. Here's a isometric drawing which describes really the layout of the kitchen and what you can see here, imagine that this wall is solid, but in fact, what it, you see here is the um, china pantry, which leads into the uh, dining room. And here's the hallway that leads you to the dining room as well. And here is the flower pantry and a storage pantry as well. So you've got this really square room. Um, and while we see a table pulled out in the middle, in fact, it would likely be put away when it wasn't in use. Generally in this period, the uh, open the, the space in the middle of the kitchen is wide open. I will say that Sarah Davis also talks about um, her relationship with her Irish servants and for Irish read Catholic, um, which amongst women of Sarah Davis's uh, class was uh, somehow a lesser person. Um, but she prides herself on her um, forward thinkingness and of the fact that she works closely with her Irish servants and that she lets them attend Roman Catholic Church and she lets them celebrate Roman Catholic holidays. Um, and so she, she, um, she boasts to her husband that she's a better mistress than are many of her neighbors. In fact, we don't know what the servants think other than we do know because she writes in one letter to her husband that the cook is complaining that she isn't paid enough. Um, so always a, a area for friction um, relationship between um, homeowners and servants <clears throat> of any type. Her kitchen, Sarah Davis's kitchen, is very much like the ideal kitchen in this print by Louis Prang uh, about 1872. <clears throat> and as you saw in the Sarah Davis kitchen, it's a built-in stove, although you could have an ideal kitchen with a stove that isn't built in. There were advantages and disadvantages to both. But the real luxury in this kitchen, in fact, there are two. One is this here, which is a water heater. So as long as your stove is warm, which it is most of the year, you will have hot water, and in this case, hot running water from a faucet. This is brand new in the 1870s, hugely luxurious. And the other thing that's brand new is a clock. Um, before this time, clocks were like luxury goods. They were in parlors rather than elsewhere. And so this is a time when women start cooking to time rather than cooking to doneness. And as a person who's not a great cook myself, I can tell you that cooking to time is not as successful as cooking to doneness. And I think it's really, transform the way we think about cooking by looking at, you know, how long is it supposed to go for as opposed to when is it going to be done. You can see that the table is set not in the middle of the room, but next to the window. You can infer that here's a window with light coming in. Um, and in fact, that's where you would want it. You'd want it where there's light coming in because the whatever um, household light you have, whether it's gas or uh, before long electric, it's not anywhere near as good as the light that you'll get from a window. So this is fundamentally different than the kitchen of the 18th century. In the 19th century, the kitchen is pretty much a women's space. Um, here we see a young boy who is peeling potatoes, but he's probably being punished, which is why he's there. Um, but more often than not, it's a space where Women of the family, women with servants, servants are all working together in the kitchen. And the kitchen is now set off. It's not part of the house, it's at the back of the house. So this is that David Davis mansion, here's the front, and we're looking down along this side. And these two windows, and this one here, are what comprise the kitchen. This is the china pantry that we saw uh, looking through the drawing. And here's the dining room. So there's a there's space that separates the kitchen even from the dining room in the best of all possible worlds. So that somehow you can live this veneer of gentility 
that suggests that you live your life out in the parlor and you don't dirty your hands with work. In fact, virtually all women dirty their hands with work. Um, even if you were running a large household and you've had a large group of servants working for you, if you left them alone and didn't oversee the work they were doing, you were asking for uh, shoddy work. So in fact, we have this painting which shows this large family in their parlor reading, um, and it's uh, very much a scene of gentility. There's a piano in the background, but you can believe that every girl in this family and the wife are spending much of their time uh, in food preparation. So this period, 1870s, 80s, is also a period of nostalgia when you have the widespread adoption of cook stoves and this backlash of looking back to a period when cooking was done at the hearth. And there's this feeling that hearth cooking was better, our lives were better, we didn't have the technology that's ruining our lives today. Um, Nathaniel Hawthorne, for instance, saw no beauty in the cook stove and he lamented its introduction. He worried that with the demise of the kitchen hearth, quote, there will be nothing to attract children to one center. Domestic life will seek its separate corners. But in fact, Sarah Orne Jewett uh, knew differently. Um, she described a man who waited until his wife was away and after a drink or two with a friend, he and the friend took the stove apart piece by piece and disposed of it. She would observe that women, quote, knew better than their husbands did the difference this useful invention had made in their everyday work. Uh, not only did it mean that they were now able to stand upright, but also, and in fact, the main reason that cook stoves were invented was they required less fuel. They burned much more efficiently, which meant less processing of wood which meant less wood had to be brought in from outside. Um, and so they were, in fact, um, uh, a more efficient way to cook. They were dirty. Uh, cook stoves were uh, dirty. You can see this young girl's little dirty paws, and you can see her little hand prints on the chrome on the side of this stove. Um, there are lots and lots of household advice books written in the second half of the 19th century, and all of them devote a considerable amount of time for how to clean your cook stove. Um, and what was learned over time is that the fancier your cook stove, the harder it was to clean. And so getting down to simplified bits that didn't have uh, engraving or ornamentation was in fact um, a way to ease your life, ease the burden of cleaning. There were issues around using a cook stove, um, not the least of them being that at least once a year, the, uh, the flu needed to be cleaned out. It was a process that uh, Mark Twain described as the most vexatious that man can possibly imagine. Um, in fact, uh, it was also an issue when you brought in servants who weren't accustomed to working with a cook stove. And so there was a period of training that had to take place. While cook stoves were making lives somewhat easier for women, it still was the case that women were confined to the kitchen more often than many of them would like. Um, many appreciated the advances in technology, but there were some who were discontent. Uh, one of my favorite, and this is not her, but I imagine her as looking like this, is a woman named Hetty Morrison of Indianapolis, who wrote in 1878, quote, not of my own free will did I enter upon a career of broiling, roasting, and baking, she complained. I wish to say that I think two thirds of cookbook makers should be hanged without benefit of clergy. Good old Hetty Morrison. Um, not everyone had a cook stove. Um, and in fact, there are amazing letters written by women who traveled west, um, writing back to their family and friends in the Northeast saying, you can't imagine what my life is like because in fact, they feel like they've dropped back a generation not being able to have a cook stove with them. This is an unusual exception. This is a sod house in the Dakota Territory. 
and you can see the um, woman of the family beaming. And I like to think she's beaming proudly because she's one of the very few people who's traveled west who has a cook stove. The reason that very few have them is that when you are traveling uh, with wagons uh, across territories, the heavier they were, the more likely they were to fail. And so before long, people were jettisoning their stoves off the side of the wagon in order to ease the travel. Of course, the situation in the South is very different. Um, in many plantations, the uh, presence of an enslaved population meant that there was no reason to upgrade the technology in your kitchen because you had essentially a free workforce. And after the Civil War, there was no money to uh, build a modern kitchen. And so people continued to live uh, using hearths in the South for much longer than they did in the Northeast. Uh, and now we'll move forward to uh, the early 20th century. This is another one of historic New England's properties. This is Castle Tucker in West Cassett, Maine. The main part of the house, in fact, what you see here of, of this protecting bay was built in 1807, but um, it continued to be built and expanded over much of the 19th century. This is a kitchen that uh, the family lived with in the 19th century. They've built the cook stove into the fireplace wall. In fact, the uh, 18th century oven is still in place, but the um, flue has gone into the chimney that once served the open hearth. Um, they're cooking, uh, they're using window, they have their table lit by windows, there's a clock. But this is the kicker. Um, and in fact, this item, which some of you may recognize, is the link between historic kitchens and kitchens today. It is in many ways the most transformative object ever to hit the kitchen in America. It's a Hoosier cabinet. It was designed to create a more efficient way of working. And here you can see the drawing of the kitchen uh, at Castle Tucker. Uh, here's the wall that had the original hearth in it with the cook stove. You've got the sink on the opposite wall. This is where the table was. So this is an outside wall with windows. But behind this door is uh, stairs leading down to a cellar. Behind this door is a pantry. And what that means is that in order to uh, do your work, you were walking from this pantry to the sink, to the table, through this door, down to the cellar to bring up grains, to bring up stored canned goods. Um, and so there was a lot of traveling involved, but the Hoosier cabinet combined a lot of processes together. And in fact, that is exactly how it was advertised. It was advertised as a way to create efficiency in the kitchen in a way that it had not existed before. And the reason that I say it's the link between uh, kitchens as we know them today and 19th century kitchens is that this is the very first time that you have an integrated cabinet with a countertop. So you can pull um, ingredients down to your countertop. You can pull up um, bowls, whisks, tools, and put them on your countertop. And it's a whole workstation in one place. So you're no longer having to move from place to place. And in fact, the ads would talk about how uh, you know, um, endorsement after endorsement of women talking about how it made their lives so much better. These came out of a very intentional um, design by a woman named Catherine Frederick, whose husband was involved in time motion studies in industry. So he would study how um, workers worked in industry and what ways uh, there were to, to make their work more efficient. So Kath Frederick um, had an aha moment when she realized that the same thing could be done for women in their kitchens. And so she developed in her home on Long Island something that she called an experiment station, which was a kitchen where things could be moved around and processes could be measured by, um, in this case, a stopwatch. 
This guy who's recording this woman beating eggs has a stopwatch to figure out how long it takes. This woman is writing notes about the direction in which she's seated, where her tools are, etc. And Catherine Frederick writes books then about the best ways, the most efficient ways to cook. And all of that ends up um, as the development of the Hoosier cabinet. And in fact, Catherine Frederick for many uh, companies that produced Hoosier cabinets was uh, endorsing them. I'm sure she was paid to endorse them, but nonetheless, um, her uh, word uh, was considered valuable. <coughs> and here you can see the development of increasing attention being paid to efficiency. Um, and so this is the next step, which is the development of the U-shaped kitchen where you have the stove, the sink, and the refrigerator around the room in a U. And that that creates this much more efficient way of working, not interrupted by a table or as in today, an island in the middle of the room, which makes you walk around it instead of more efficiently. Um, now, efficiency meant smaller, and not everybody was um, thrilled with uh, the smaller kitchens. In fact, writing in 1900, a woman who was a home economist, noted home economist, wrote, a small kitchen is much more convenient than a large one, although even that has its drawbacks, as the whole family are apt to congregate where mother is. It's anything but agreeable to have every inch of available space around the cook stove occupied by irresponsible, hungry people while the cook, tired and perhaps cross, must reach in between or over their heads to attend to things. So small, efficient, but maybe not the perfect solution. The most efficient kitchen, bar none, was a kitchen that was developed in Germany, in Frankfurt, Germany, in 1928. Uh, after World War I, um, when a lot of apartment uh, buildings were going up and um, architects were looking for a way to install a kitchen that was both um, not taking up a lot of space, but highly efficient. And they were this was developed by a uh, female architect whose name is unpronounceable by me, um, but who uh, thought about a kitchen as a laboratory and looked at scientific labs and figured out how she could adapt what is done in labs to kitchen work. The Frankfurt kitchen was installed in apartment complexes in Frankfurt. It won't surprise you to hear that women hated them because of course, people are gonna join you in the kitchen and in a space like that, suddenly what was an efficient kitchen becomes an unworkable one. Um, I will say that the Frankfurt Kitchen is still noted as a uh, monument of design. And in fact, there's one at the um, Museum of Modern Art in New York. This is a particularly early, uh, more modern kitchen. And not surprisingly, it is in the home of the Bauhaus architect, Walter Gropius, who emigrated to America in uh, the 1930s and was given uh, money by a uh, patron to build the house that he wanted uh, that reflected his modern principles and ideals. And in that house, he built a version of the Frankfurt kitchen, slightly larger, but for the first time now you get this modern idea of cabinets over a counter with cabinets below all built at the same height as the workspace of the stove itself and with the sink uh, integrated into the countertops. <clears throat> Interestingly, um, when the Gropius family moved into this house, they had a servant who worked in the kitchen um, named, um, uh, I'm forgetting what her name is, but in fact, uh, during World War II, so let's say about, um, Eight years after this kitchen is completed, um, the cook leaves to work in the munitions industry. And that leaves Walter Gropius' wife, Adi, working in the kitchen herself. Um, her stepdaughter recalled that this was not all that successful. 
She says, all the delicate gourmet recipes that Isa, her mother, her stepmother, had collected now lay in her own lap and were to be served impeccably on the dot of seven. In time, she became a cook of great expertise, but never one of joy. And the atmosphere of dogged desperation, which I remember in the kitchen, is no doubt partly the reason why I never became a cook. Now, there's lots of commercialization of kitchen work that appears in the 20th century. This, in fact, is not kitchen work, but it's something central to kitchen work or the transformation of the kitchen. This is the arrival of, the elect of electricity to the farm. Uh, it's a General Electric promotional ad uh, from the 1930s, and it suggests that light is coming up over the horizon along with electricity and it will make your life um, that much cleaner, that much healthier, that much easier. Needless to say, not everyone got electricity when General Electric started promoting it in the 1930s. And in fact, in farm areas, uh, even in New England, it wasn't until the late 40s, even early 50s before electricity was virtually pervasive. And until that time, people were living as did their grandparents uh, in the 19th century. But also you have um, urban kitchens where it's not possible to have the space separating out dining from kitchen work. Uh, and here you see an immigrant family in the Lower East Side um, who are dining in their kitchen and another immigrant family who were doing daily work, in this case, lace making in the kitchen. So there's a lot of disconnect between the ideal and the actual. Moving into the post-World War II years, we come upon a time when there is a housing crisis in America, because during World War II, there was virtually 100% employment and there was little time and little uh, goods to be purchased. For instance, General Electric has transformed its work and is entirely working in munitions. Um, and so they, in the meantime, put out ads telling Americans, just wait, when the war is over, we'll have all these new great things for you and that show women imagining new stoves or new refrigerators. When um, men come back from war um, and have uh, disposable income as uh, both they and their wives or their fiancés have been working um, and they look to buy, there aren't a lot of houses available. And this, for instance, is a Quonset hut set up outside of Hartford to address the housing crisis. But the person who addressed it perhaps most successfully was a man named uh, William Levitt, who you see on the cover of Time Magazine. And you see one of the Levitt towns that he created in the Mid-Atlantic region. He created them in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Long Island. And these houses were very much intentionally designed. And here we see a woman holding her baby, uh, talking to friends in front of her Levitt town house in Pennsylvania. And she uh, was still living when we um, did our kitchen project and we were able to talk to her about her kitchen, which you can see here. Um, you can see it both as it was reinstalled when she finally replaced it. Uh, and it was reinstalled at the Pennsylvania Museum, Historical Museum. Um, she hated it uh, for most of her adult life. She hated the fact that it was pink but General Electric um, had already figured out at this point about designed obsolescence. And if you color everything in the kitchen the same color, then when one thing goes bad, everything gets replaced or so was their hope. And I think it was likely true for a lot of families, but not for Sally Sandusky who kept hers until the uh, 1990s. And you can see that it's the beginning of this open plan. So you've got a U-shaped kitchen, highly efficient, which we know from that drawing, um, but it opens out into a small breakfast eating area where her young children and her husband can eat um, and imagine that this is uh, the garage, um, but it's cut away in this picture. So she had very fond memories <clears throat> of her life uh, in Levittown. <clears throat> 
but not so much this woman. This is Daisy Myers. <clears throat> William Levitt wrote that while um, he could address the housing crisis, it was the crisis that he could address, but he could not deal with racial crisis in America. And therefore he refused to sell to Jews or to black families. Um, but he could not prevent owners from selling themselves to black families. So Daisy Myers and her husband were the first black family to move into Levittown, Pennsylvania, buying from a previous owner. And their experience was anything but uh, a good one. And in fact, <clears throat> I find this a really poignant photograph because you can imagine that Daisy is looking out onto her front lawn where people are burning crosses and her kitchen has become a bunker rather than a place of solace. And it wasn't until the Pennsylvania Attorney General got involved that uh, the Myers family were protected from the outrage of their neighbors. <clears throat> Daisy Myers was still alive and I think is still today, um, but wouldn't talk to us uh, and nor did we press it because the um, experience was so negative for her. And this is a photograph from Life magazine. So even her um, despair was documented. Now, counter this to the ideal kitchen of Madison Avenue, which you see here. Um, I think of this as a leave it to beaver kitchen. So you've got the um, mother of the house uh, in her uh, beautiful dress with her high heels, everything's gleaming. Her child is spotless and smiling and well-behaved. Um, and so this is the kitchen that is being promoted on Madison Avenue. It's efficient, it's, um, it's light, it's lovely. Um, it is, uh, of course, um, it's a room that now the family spends time in, very much unlike what we saw before. So we've kind of gone full circle. We've gone from women um, having a veneer that takes them away from the kitchen to moving back into the kitchen, in part because of the change of the labor market. It's no longer possible to have a house full of servants. That kitchen is supported by industry in the food world as well. So now for the first time, you have frozen dinners and you have Tupperware that enables you to save food and put in your freezer. Now, as ideal as that kitchen is, not everybody believed in the ideal of the late 50s, early 60s. Um, and Peg Bracken capitalized on the counter uh, movement about kitchens, um, writing, uh, in fact, uh, the I Hate to Cook book, which I will say was my mother's favorite cookbook. Um, and one of uh, her recipes um, was for, uh, let's see, it was for uh, beef stroganoff, in which she writes, add the flour, salt, paprika, and mushrooms, stir, and let it cook five minutes while you light a cigarette and stare sullenly at the sink. And the counter, of course, to Peg Bracken is, uh, of course, the much loved uh, local hero, Julia Child. So Julia Child, working at the same time that Peg Bracken was, creates instead her uh, French cookbook. And in fact, she taps into uh, this uh, belief that in fact, food can be good. And in fact, she says that in her autobiography that somehow or another, um, people had lost a sense of what good food really was. And she discovered it when she traveled to Paris and lived there with her husband um, and decided that that was something that she could bring back. Um, she trained at the Cordon Bleu um, and spent, I think, decades, certainly years and years, working with two uh, French women to create um, the cookbook that we all know and love today. Um, in fact, her joyful approach um, was sort of the, the counterpoint to Peg Bracken's sullen sink staring. Now, moving us <clears throat> forward, um, we come to the time of the women's uh, liberation of the 1960s and 70s, when you have a period when women are moving into communes and cooking becomes a shared activity. 
I will tell you that um, that hardcore feminists still believe that cooking, it, if it's shared, is the only way that women can be truly liberated. Um, and so they uh, believe in co-housing, where um, where one person cooks a week as opposed to uh, one day a week as opposed to all week long. And that's what you're seeing at this commune out, outside of California, or outside of San Francisco in California. And then you get Madison Avenue's version of a women's uh, live kitchen, which still has her cooking all by herself in the kitchen. But somehow or another, she's modern, she's liberated, she likes orange and yellow and green. And that'll bring us all the way up to today's ideal kitchen. So you see here um, the uh, shelter magazine idea of what a kitchen should look like. There should be an island where family and friends can gather. There should be a so-called farmhouse kitchen, a professional stove, um, and lots and lots of counter space and cabinetry. Um, and of course, it should be spotless. Needless to say, many people do not live an ideal world with an ideal kitchen. Um, so some, for instance, have children, uh, which um, makes maintaining spotless countertops a little more difficult. And some people live in, for instance, apartments in New York, um, where the kitchens tend to be quite small. Um, some of you may recognize this author. Uh, this is Mark Bittman, the former head of the cooking magazine, of the cooking column in the New York Times and the creator of uh, outrageous recipes in this tiny little kitchen of which he himself says, it's all you need. You don't need a huge kitchen um, to create great food. Although he does complain about the fact that he does end up storing some of his kitchen equipment in the oven. And so when he needs his oven, it has to come out to the living room. Uh, this brings us to, and in fact, he also, I would say, boasts about having a window, which many people in New York do not have in their kitchen. But this brings us to this image, um, which is one of my favorites. Um, it is uh, a obviously a Madison Avenue look at the kitchen. Men and, are more and more often in the kitchen these days. Um, and in fact, this reminds me of a quotation from the New York Times uh, from the early 2000s uh, by a sociologist from the University of Pennsylvania who wrote that it's not until you have men in the kitchen that you can justify the $275 knife. Um, and in fact, uh, you're justifying, I think in this particular kitchen, many very expensive pieces of equipment that are lovely, although maybe not so necessary. Bringing us forward to um, today uh, and to say that the Symbolic center of the home, the kitchen gives meaning to family life. It's a place where parents nurture children, families gather at breakfast and dinner, share chores, uh, and um, it's the site of long held traditions, celebrations and solace, and the place of day to day life. It's a place of nourishment as well as comfort. Here you can see a celebration of Thanksgiving in a painting of the 1930s with families and animals all gathered together. But it's not always an easy place. And in fact, uh, here we see a disaster which has occurred in a 19th century kitchen where the cook has decided to leave. You can see her through the window and the wife of the family is desperately thinking, what will we do now? And her husband says, there, there, dear, I'll help. And of course she knows that that's no help at all. But in the end, more than any room in the house, the kitchen shapes and reflects who we are. From an early age, we observe the roles men and women play in the kitchen. We experiment with both new and old technology. We eat foods that reflect our heritage and our beliefs. And as our lives do change, so do our kitchens. Regardless of whether we love them or hate them, it's clear that our kitchens reveal the complexities of American culture. Thank you all. Thank you all for sticking with us. <laughs>
Well, great job, Nancy, as expected. Uh, let's take uh, 10 minutes of questions and then we'll get folks out of here. Uh, Elena asks, why weren't the kitchens built into the basements as in many British stately homes? Good question. Um, and I don't have an answer to that. There are some places where kitchens were in basements, uh, Pennsylvania, Philadelphia in particular, uh, basement kitchens were not uncommon. Some uh, southern plantations had kitchens in the basements, but for whatever reason, and perhaps it's because of the rocky, um, the rocky terrain in New England, it is rare. I'm trying to think of any place that I can think of basement kitchens. Um, and other than in cities built later, I can't. Uh, DL asks, uh, when was oil introduced as fuel for a cook stove? End of the 19th century, there was a lot of experimentation with fuel for cook stoves, sometimes oil, sometimes God help us gasoline. Um, and so it did occur then. Um, and I don't know why it did not persist, but it did not, I suspect, because of the danger. So when you see cook stoves going into the 20th century, they remain wood fired. Uh, Sandy asks, uh, please share the title and availability of the end of the 18th century memoir regarding how women divided the space or created a second kitchen in order to be in charge of their own kitchen. Give me a second to think about it. It's, um, it's the title is Reminiscences of an Octogenarian. And that should get you to it. Um, and I, uh, in fact, I can see that Robert's gonna look it up, which is great. <laughs> um, it's a woman who uh, grew up in Newbury, and I believe she writes it uh, when she's living in Salem as an 80-year-old. I'll see what I can figure out. The first one that pops up is written by a man, so that's probably not it. <laughs> um, Polly asks, did they ever raise the height of the tables they used in the kitchens, or did women still have to bend over to work at them? So, um, you would think, wouldn't you, that a higher uh, height, um, I mean, certainly that's one of the advantages of uh, islands today is that higher height. But I'm not aware of tables that were made higher in the 19th century. I think what happened instead is that um, women often work sitting down, um, which we no longer seem to do much today in the kitchen. But I'm not aware of, um, what seems like a more like an obvious move to raise the height of the table. Uh, an anonymous attendee asks, when did floor coverings become acceptable in kitchens? Were dirt, were dirt floors actually easier to maintain with kitchen spills? So 17th century homes had wooden floors in the kitchen. Um, they often had sand covering the wooden floor that could be sweeped out, um, but the floor itself was wooden. Uh, dirt floors would have been uh, around in those early, early colonial houses of the 17th century. Um, the kind that you see, there's one on, there's one on the lower green in a recreated one in Ipswich. Um, so single room, kind of like what you would see in um, Plymouth as well. But by the time you're building a wooden house of two stories, the kitchen floor would be wooden. Uh, Kirsten asks, do you have any idea when, when, when women started wearing the apron in the kitchen? And was it a woman who invented the apron? I have no idea. Fascinating. That's a very interesting question. I'm sure it's known by um, costume historians. Uh, Teresa asks, in your research, did you find anything about the trend in the 1950s and 1960s to have a second kitchen in the basement? Oh, I'm so glad you asked that. Yes, it's one of my favorite stories. And some of you may know about this. It tended to be amongst immigrant families. Um, was not just a desire for, but a belief that a house wasn't complete if you didn't have a second kitchen. And one of the kitchens was your show kitchen, 
where people were invited in when you had uh, social encounters, but your work kitchen would be separate, usually in the basement. And that's where all of the food was cooked. And um, we actually, Historic New England, um, met a family that were, believe it or not, they were um, uh, redo redoing their 1950s show kitchen. Um, even though, as the um, male owner of the house said to me, we don't cook, we don't even eat much. Um, and yet his wife's sort of sense of what a house was, was a house that had a kitchen, a work kitchen in the basement and a show kitchen on the first floor. And so after having dutifully upgraded the basement kitchen, um, he was now upgrading the show kitchen uh, at the behest of his wife. And we took the um, appliances from the old kitchen uh, and have them on it uh, at Historic New England. Uh, Rosamond asks, do you know how many historic kitchens are left in New England? That must be a tough question to answer. Yeah, so for our, for our money, historic is a broad term. Um, and so for instance, that 1930s kitchen at the Gropius House is historic for us. Um, I would say that the bones of historic kitchens still survive in a lot of places. But um, as I said, we have 83 kitchens, most of them historic in our historic houses. Um, and so um, I am, uh, I'm guessing that there are still plenty of them out there. All right, I'm trying to, there's a lot of comments. I'm trying to get to here. Um, Rosamond asks, are galley kitchens similar to Frankfurt kitchens? Yes, they are similar, but not the same. So the Frankfurt kitchen is very specific. It had all of those little drawers that you could see on the side, but it was long and narrow as is a galley kitchen. Um, and uh, galley kitchen is, uh, is incredibly efficient, uh, but incredibly unsocial. Um, and so uh, they are uh, not much loved unless you really like to cook and you don't really care about having people in your kitchen. So uh, Emily thinks that she may have tracked down the author you couldn't think of. Uh, is it Euphemia Vale Smith? Euphemia, I might be mispronouncing that. E U P H E M I A. Does that ring a bell? It doesn't ring a bell, which isn't to say that it's not the right uh, author. And what's the title? Uh, she didn't say. Yeah. So um, it could be. It could be. All right, well, uh, let me uh, pump your ego here a little bit and read you some comments from the chat now. Um, oh, and well, Kim mentions that Johnson and Johnson Wales University has a wonderful kitchen museum. So we they should do. check that out. They do. Uh, Seth, have you been there, Nancy? Or well, I have, and I think they might have closed the museum, unfortunately. Okay. But they have a great kitchen program, a cooking program. Uh, Teresa says, this has been very interesting. Sally says, outstanding presentation. Thank you for sharing your detailed history, illustrations, and wonderful fo photographs. She enjoyed it. Uh, Rosamond said, it was a great program. Patricia says, great presentation. Uh, Renee notes that um, she lived in a Levitt house uh, in New Jersey, and she had an aqua kitchen, which she loved. Nice. Uh, let's see here. Sheila says, uh, Sheila says, thank you. Very interesting. Pat says she loved your presentation. Oh my gosh, Dale, thank uh, you Darlene said this was wonderful. <laughs> um, Bracca says thank you from Scottsdale, Arizona. Let's see. Joyce says excellent program. Well, it's 315 ish. Why don't we wrap it there? I do apologize. We didn't get to quite all the questions, but we got to most of them. Uh, Nancy, do you have any last words for the group uh, before we wrap? Well, go forth and conquer in your kitchens if you choose to. There you go. Good, good, uh, good words to, uh, to end there. Uh, so thank you all so much. I look for an email for me tomorrow with a link to a feedback survey, a link to this recording, and uh, some information about some other upcoming programs we're uh, partnering with Historic New England for. Uh, next month, we're learning about the history of stone walls in New England.
So if you've ever wanted to know about stone walls, you're going to learn everything you ever wanted to know uh, next month. So uh, thank you so much, Nancy, and I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their afternoon. Thanks again. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.